So I'm going to tell you a bit of a story today. And I'm probably the only designer on stage today, I think. So let's get into it. Are the slides showing up? No. There we go. Cool. So in 2003, the New York Times interviewed Steve Jobs about the success of the iPod. And this was my favorite part of what he said. So he said, design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. Now, since you're at Platform Engineering Day, I'm going to guess you probably don't consider yourself a designer. But if you're responsible for deciding how your organization's internal developer platform works, I want to convince you that you are actually doing design. So in this session, I'm going to share how you can use principles from the field of UX to create an internal developer platform that your developers actually love using. And you don't even need to wear a black turtleneck to use some of the principles that I'm going to share with you today. So by the way, my name is Kirsten Schwarzer, and I'm a lead product designer at Octopus Deploy. So how do you avoid getting into a situation like this, where you've spent months building an internal developer platform, but the adoption is slower than you hoped it would be. Uh, the users you do have are running into frustrating issues that are slowing them down. And you're not really getting the glowing reviews that you expected for all this hard work that you've put in. So why is it so hard to design a good internal developer platform? I think the answer lies in the definition. And I really like this one from internaldeveloperplatform.org. So this is the only time I'll read off the slides, but it's a really long one. So an internal developer platform is built by a platform team to build golden paths and enable developer self-service. An IDP consists of many different tech and tools glued together, that's your first clue, in a way that lowers cognitive load on developers without abstracting away context and underlying technologies. That's the second clue. And then depending on the maturity of the IDP, it provides several interfaces and access points. That's the third clue. So figuring out how to glue together different tools to lower cognitive load while not abstracting away com uh, context is a really tough UX challenge. So my goal with this presentation is to give you a really clear direction for what to do next. So I'll be sharing some practical UX principles that you can use and combine. Uh, so let's get into it. Are you guilty of designing things in a way that makes sense to you, but not to your users? So I want to introduce you to the false consensus effect. Now, this is a cognitive bias where humans overestimate the extent to which our preferences and our habits are normal and um, the same as other people. So one of the most important realizations you can have as a designer is that you are not your user. And your solution may actually be more of a reflection of your own preferences than your actual user needs. So we've actually run into this challenge a bit at Octopus. Most of the engineers that I work with uh, build features for Kubernetes. So they use Kubernetes all the time. But their day to day looks totally different to someone who works on a platform team at a multinational corporation, you know, running production clusters across many geographies. Their needs are not the same. So how do we overcome this cognitive bias? So you want to start doing lightweight user research. And I know you're very busy, and this is something that you're going to have to do on top of everything else that you're already doing. Um, but I think it's worth it. And so I've tried to make it as simple as possible for you to get started. So what you want to do is called a think aloud study. This is where you ask one of your users to uh, do a typical task with your IDP. So it should take around 30 minutes to an hour, not longer than that. Uh, you want to remind them that you're testing the platform. You're not testing them. Uh, you want to ask them to share their thoughts out loud as they're doing the task. Remember to press record. Um, and basically, stay quiet 
and let them talk while they complete this task. So there are lots of fancy tools on the market that UX researchers use for this sort of thing, but any video conferencing tool that has recording and transcription is good enough. And after you've recorded those sessions, you want to analyze them to see where do users run into friction? Where are they getting stuck? And so you want to start creating a backlog of those ideas. And you can also note down how severely something affects the user experience and how often this crops up across the different users that you speak to. So once you start implementing this user research habit, so I would recommend starting with like one a week, nothing too crazy. Um, you'll start to gain a lot of confidence that the effort you're putting into your IDP is actually going to improve your developer experience because it's based on the problems that your users actually have. Uh, you'll also be a lot less prone to stakeholder interference where your boss comes in and tells you what they think you should build, but you already know what to build because you did the research and you have the data to back it up. So, your users will also feel like you're listening to them, and you might discover some really interesting issues that were actually causing them problems that you wouldn't have expected. So in addition to what you learn from your users, I've curated three additional UX principles that relate directly to IDPs. So in the 1980s, at the IBM User Interface Institute, John Carroll and Mary Beth Rossen came across a really interesting phenomena. So they noticed that users wouldn't read the manuals that came with their bright, shiny new computers. They would just start using them. <laughs> Even though uh, the paradox is it would have been better for them to read some of the manuals and the docs up front, you know, build up some foundational knowledge, and then try to use the computer. But humans are not rational and we should design for the way that our users really act instead of how we wish they would act. So in the case of your IDP, it's really unlikely that your developers are going to read a bunch of documentation up front. They're going to be much more motivated by the specific task that they want to accomplish. So this doesn't mean you don't need documentation, but you do need to keep this in mind when you design the onboarding experience. So let's go over some ways that we can simplify that onboarding experience, knowing that the docs likely are not going to be the first port of call. So the first thing you want to do is to understand the onboarding experience and what that's actually like for your users. So you can watch them through talk aloud studies, you can interview them, you can survey them, and then you can start to piece all that data together on a user journey map. Now, a user journey map typically covers the end-to-end -end user experience from start to finish. But since UX is probably not your day job, I'd recommend just focusing on the onboarding experience to get started. So the first step is to break that experience into distinct phases. So that's the columns that you see on this table. So discovering the platform, getting access, your first project, and so on. So next, you want to fill in the actions that your users need to take in each of those phases. Then you want to write down their thoughts and emotions. Are they confused? Are they frustrated? Do they feel confident uh, in the actions they need to take during that phase? Then you want to note down the touch points that they come into contact with. And now this is particularly important for an IDP because like we saw in the definition, there can be so many different interfaces and access points. And there may be some non-obvious ones, like let's say your SecOps team Slack channel where they need to request access to tools. That's all part of the onboarding experience. Now, as you note down those touch points, you'll start to recognize where friction lies in the onboarding experience. And you can note that down under opportunities. And a good place to look for that is where you have to switch between different interfaces to complete a task. So once you've completed the map up to this point, um, you're going to start really getting a good uh, grasp of what the user experience is actually like and what it's like to onboard uh, into your internal developer platform. And you can keep updating this user journey map as you work on improving the experience. And so it really becomes a living document and a guidepost for 
you know, what your users do and how they feel as they use your platform over time. Now, the next principle is focused specifically on reducing cognitive load during the onboarding experience. It's called progressive disclosure, and it's basically um, you deciding to not reveal all the information at once, and rather giving your users information that they need at the point when they need it. So for example, if you have a service catalog, you can create a recommended section with just a few services that you know users will get immediate value from, and it just makes their onboarding experience a lot less daunting. Here's an example of something a team at Octopus recently did. So uh, if you want to select steps for your deployment process, I think we have more than 150 of them, uh, how do you know which one to pick? So they created a featured section, which is specifically aimed at new users and helping them decide which steps to include in their deployment process as they get started. Now my next tip for improving the onboarding experience is to provide contextual help. So this is where you give users relevant information within the specific context of the task that they're completing. So I know IDPs are often made up of like a bunch of commercial tools, open source tools, and some custom built pieces. So you probably don't have control over all of the interfaces. And that's why it's really important to evaluate the commercial and open source tools that you do add to your stack based on how good their contextual help is. For example, does the UI of your CD tool give users contextual help when they need to feel confident about a complex selection in the UI? Or does another tool in your stack have a help flag in the CLI that gives users an idea of the type of commands that they can use or that gives them specific help for a specific command that they're having trouble with without having to leave the interface. So if you're um, creating a portal with a custom or an open source UI, you could use something like App Queues, which is a platform that lets you add an onboarding checklist as an overlay on top of whichever interface it is. Uh, and this will help users basically understand which steps they need to take in the right sequence without leaving the interface. And then if we're looking at IDEs, I think the most sophisticated form of contextual help that users currently have access to is something like GitHub uh, Copilot. So it's basically where the AI uh, proactively provides suggestions for what users should do next based on the specific task that they're working on. Now, my next principle comes from Jared Spool. He is a legend in the field of UX. And he says that errors are a proxy for frustration. So I agree, and I think there's three parts to solving the error problem. The first one is to prevent the most commonly occurring errors. So if you use any logging solutions or if the tools uh, in your platform come with built-in logs, it's a really useful exercise to count the error messages that occur the most frequently. It sounds a bit boring, but it's actually really high value. So another way that you could get this data is to mine support tickets from your developers to see which errors crop up the most often. And you may even want to interview your users if you find errors that are a bit unexpected and don't make sense to you. They'll be able to tell you where they're going wrong. So once you have this list of errors that you want to address, think about the different ways that you could help users prevent those errors from happening in the first place. So if an error is caused by incorrect user input, can you give them better validation? Can you give them templates or snippets that already have the correct information in them? And again, can you give them contextual help to help them make complex choices in an interface? So the second part to tackling the error problem is actually helping your users when they do encounter errors. And giving them error messages like this is a guaranteed way to add to their frustration. So for the parts of the platform where you have control over error messages, it's really worth your time to write good ones. Uh, and you don't have to rewrite them all at once. You can take a really pragmatic approach based on the ones that users encounter most often. 
So for the errors that you actually have control over and that you found occur quite frequently, uh, you can create a scoring rubric to evaluate how good those error messages are. So there are lots of more sophisticated scoring models and error guidelines out there, but I try to really simplify it down to the core of what you really need to get started. So you want to answer yes to each of these five questions. Are you telling your user what happened? Do they know why it happened? Will they understand what they should do next? Do they recognize the words that are being used? And is the tone positive and supportive? So let's look at a better example that actually takes those five criteria into account. So this is telling you what happened. It says you need additional permissions. It's telling you why it happened. It's because you're trying to integrate with external APIs. The user will know what to do because it tells them they need to complete a form. And it also links to that form in the button at the bottom. Uh, there's no obscure language that the average application developer has never heard of. And most importantly, it doesn't blame the user. Instead, it focuses on the problem and not what the user did wrong. Now, the final part to reducing frustration because of errors is to create really good documentation. Now, I know we covered the paradox of the active user at the beginning. But like I said, that doesn't mean that your engineers don't need documentation. They're just more likely to reach for it once they find themselves in a tricky situation where they don't know what to do next. So some people say that your UX should be so good that you don't need any documentation. But I've been working on highly technical platforms for the last seven years, and I just don't think that's true. Uh, this is not the same as using Instagram or Uber. Like, we're designing complex platforms for users who are doing really technical tasks. We're probably going to need some documentation. The next thing you want to do with your docs is to provide step-by-step -step guidance for new or complex tasks that users need to accomplish. So they might try something on their own first, figure out that it's a bit hard, and then decide to follow a guide. So you want to make sure that you break those guides into very clear sections with subheadings. And you want to make them as linear as possible. So if there are any side quests that your users need to do, like running a command in the terminal or creating an account in some tool, you want to put all of that in the guide and make it really linear. So they won't need 12 windows open to figure out what they need to do next. Now, the next principle we're going to cover comes from the field of cybernetics. And it's called Ashby's Law, or the Law of Requisite Variety. Now, I have the complex, true version on the screen. Um, but in essence, what it says is that a system needs to be able to handle the variety of its environment to survive. So how does that actually apply to an IDP? I think it can be really tempting to oversimplify an internal developer platform and try and force as much standardization as possible. But if your system doesn't meet the complex demands of your user's environment, it just won't survive in the long run. So I think there are two parts to actually using Ashby's law to improve the developer experience. So firstly, you want to be able to handle the complexity of your user's environment. And then you want to be able to handle the changing nature of their environment. So as users become more proficient in your platform, they're going to bring more and more advanced use cases to it. Users don't stay beginners forever. So don't forget about your advanced users. Now, in the field of UX, there are 10 usability heuristics that were created by Jacob Nielsen in the 90s. And number seven is flexibility and ease of use. And what it says is that you should design a system that caters to both inexperienced and experienced users. So you want to do that by providing things like advanced options to more experienced users that make their configuration more customizable, like the example that we have on the screen. Another way is to give them shortcuts or automations so they can do repetitive tasks faster. So basically what you're doing is you're providing multiple ways to achieve the same task, but catering it to different levels. 
So the main thing that you want to remember is you don't want to oversimplify at the cost of your advanced users. You have to think about both. Now the last part to Ashby's law is all about being adaptable. So we've seen so much change in the industry over the last year. Many companies don't exist anymore. Large language models are now part of our daily lives. And the amazing CNCF community just keeps creating new tools. You don't want your platform to become stale and to no longer match the environment that your user operates in. It needs to be able to adapt to future changes. And this really is a key part to ensure that it keeps getting used over time. So this may even affect how you architect your platform. Like I said in the beginning, I agree with Steve Jobs. Design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is actually how it works. So the first thing that you should do when you uh, get home from KubeCon is to start getting user feedback. So that's really going to help you build a backlog that's based on user research. Then you want to focus on onboarding, on errors, and on the adaptability of your platform. So if you do those things, the people who already use your platform will have a better experience. They'll be more productive, and they'll tell their colleagues. And this creates a virtuous cycle where the more feedback you get, the better you can make your platform, the more users you get, and the more productive your team becomes. And your IDP can actually end up in a situation where it just keeps improving your developer experience over time. And that's the power of investing in UX. So here's a cheat sheet of what we've covered today. Uh, the slides are available to download at the QR code. And I'd love your feedback. I'd love to hear what you thought of the presentation. And um, yeah, if you want to come and say hi, I'll be at booth G26 all week. So you're welcome to uh, come and ask any questions there as well. All right, thank you so much. How are we on time? Perfect. That was fantastic. Thank you. Anyone got any questions for Kirsten? Oh, yes. So I've actually got two, because um, I do a lot of the kind of stuff you're talking about there for my squad. Um, one of the questions was you were talking about the, the linear yep. um, documentation. Make sure you don't have any side quests. Totally agree. But what I've also found is that you end up with a lot of duplication because you don't want to send them on a side quest, but then you end up having the same information and then it might start getting out of place because you rely on someone else to update it in three places. Do you, do you have any tips for preventing that or are there a better way of dealing with that? Or is that the exception to linear stuff? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So I think uh, something that that's a bit counterintuitive to think about is that sometimes when we design things, we want to make sure that the sort of model is as clean as possible and like we're not repeating ourselves and things like that. But sometimes it's worth making those trade-offs to put everything right in front of the user. So it doesn't have to be a blanket rule where you do that every single time. But let's say for the first experience, um, it, it may be worth trading off that duplication to just make sure that users don't get lost uh, when they need to navigate through a bunch of different links. Because uh, it can be quite hard to orient yourself to where you are, which step you're busy completing. Um, so yeah, I think especially focusing on the first user experience, it's worth the duplication. But later on, it might be a trade-off that's not worth it. If you're thinking about more advanced users, they'll be able to navigate it probably quite well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great, yeah. actually. Thank you. Um, and I've just got another question. Um, you had the novice versus the advanced users, user experience, which do you do first? Like, because, you know, out of releasing kind of thing, you would you would start with one probably rather than being able to provide for both. Who who gets priority? Do you give the advanced people the tools or do you go, well, we want to bring everybody on board at first? So. Yeah, I think when it comes to increasing adoption, focusing on new users first, it's just, it's easy wins, basically. If you can remove friction, make things obvious, like what to do next, uh, 
those new users will eventually become advanced users. So I think uh, if I had to approach it, that's, that's probably what I would do, is, is focus on the new users first. So you actually, uh, you also start getting a lot of data where people are getting stuck. Uh, and then you can work like through that journey. I think I showed the user journey map earlier. So you can actually extend that to the full user experience and start to include more advanced use cases. But yeah, I'd recommend focusing on new users and on their onboarding to get started. Yeah. Hi. Um, so one question you said that we should do those think aloud studies. Um, but this mainly focused on existing internal developer platforms. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, integrate user feedback or user experience um, when you evaluate such a project and plan your internal developer platform from, from the baseline on where users don't, might not know what is possible? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So in that scenario, typically what we do is more generative like discovery research. So we want to discover the problems that users have and just interviewing them is the best, uh, yeah, sort of best bang for your buck in that scenario. If you can spend 30 minutes with them, ask them about their problems, which things are taking the most time, you know, which things are frustrating them the most, they will tell you. Um, so it's, it's really about listening to your users. And, um, I'm really lucky, so the product manager that I work with is sitting here in the back of the room, and I think we did like almost 100 interviews last year, the two of us, um, with users to find out those sort of discovery generative questions for the new things that we actually want to build. So yeah, that's what I would recommend, is just interview them. Yeah. Hello, uh, happy birthday again. Uh, Thank you. One of the questions that I wanted to ask, like we had a lot of discussion about onboarding, but in our company, one of the challenges that we have, like we have a lot of tenured engineers, and they know how to get around the errors of the system pretty well. So it's sometimes really hard to get like proper feedback from them because they're just like, yeah, I'm good with it, kind of feedback. So like, how do you actually get the frustration points from those tenured people that knows that they're like truly advanced users and when they are the majority of the users of the system? So that's also something that you learn the more you watch users is what users say isn't always what they do. So I would actually in that scenario, really watch what they're doing as they're going through that study. Like they may say that something is easy, but then they actually still get stuck um, somewhere. They just know how to fix it. So in that scenario, you might be improving something for a more novice user, because even a tenured person gets stuck there. They just know how to get out of it. So I would say really pay attention to the video recording and what users are actually doing versus just listening to what they say, because sometimes those things don't actually match up. Yeah. Any other questions for Kirsten? Other than why are you doing a talk on your birthday? But we appreciate it. Okay, thanks very much, Kirsten. Thank you, everyone.